Um, thanks a lot to Rich and, and, and Jorn for organizing this panel um, and to the organizers of the conference. Um, and thanks to all of you for getting up so early. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about some of my uh, work trying to understand uh, what happens during bone in uh, cortex cerebellum circuits. So uh, the cerebellum, of course, long evolutionarily predates uh, the neocortex, but uh, from the time that mammals have come on the scene, the two structures have expanded basically in tandem uh, with a pretty conserved uh, ratio of about four times as many neurons in the cerebellum as that in the cerebral cortex. And because the rest of the brain has not really kept pace with that expansion, uh, what you find is that 99% of all neurons in the human brain are contained in these two structures. And they're also densely interconnected. So pretty much any part of the neocortex that you're looking, what you find is that nearly all subcortically projecting layer 5 parameter neurons will send an axon collateral to the neurons of the pontine nuclei, nearly all of which project up to the cerebellum, and specifically to cerebellar granule cells. And there's an analogous reciprocal pathway back to the cortex via the thalamus. So it does always make me wonder whether there's some kind of basic computation performed by these conserved cortex cerebellum loops. Um, because a lot of this anatomical work uh, has not been done so much in, in mice, uh, and this is a system that I studied. I wanted to characterize this projection a little bit more at the anatomical level first, uh, using some of the more precise um, uh, biogenetic tracing tools available to us. So uh, I performed a disynaptic uh, tracing study where um, you initiate tracing from a particular model of the cerebellum by transducing a pontine mossy fiber axon terminals with a reagent that allows you to then initiate uh, monosynaptic retrograde radius tracing from those pontine neurons to see which cortical neurons are presynaptic to them. And basically what you find is that uh, essentially all areas of the cortex project disynaptically to these parts of the cerebellum ranging from prefrontal areas to somatomotor areas, uh, cingulate, um, the various parietal association cortices, uh, visual and auditory cortex. Um, so what I've been spending most of my time on is trying to understand how I can uh, study this circuit at a functional level. And so uh, I've pushed on a few different fronts. So one is to develop head-fixed behaviors that engage both of these circuits that mice can acquire uh, over weeks-long time scales and to use two-photon calcium imaging to track the evolution of neural activity over these time scales. And finally, the simultaneous and monitoring of perturbed activity in both circuits uh, during their learning. So I'll start by telling you uh, about the behavior. Um, basically, I, I have a, a task where head fix mice to grasp and manipulate them and, and make movements to the water or uh, you know, heavily uh, inspired by the primate work that um, has been pioneered by many, including uh, many of you here. Um, and basically, uh, the mice um, make 100 to 200 millisecond forelimb movements, um, followed by a delay period while they wait for the uh, delivery of a reward, and another delay period uh, while they wait for the robot to uh, automatically return to them so that they can initiate the next trial at a time of their choosing. And so I've used this to study simple forward pushing movements, um, more complex uh, movement sequences, um, sort of aiming movements and uh, aiming at multiple targets, for example. Um, I've shown that uh, both the premotor cortex and the dorsal surface of the cerebellum were required for the execution of this task by uh, using um, some really nice uh, genetic tools developed by others that allow me to express uh, channel rhodopsin, uh, specifically in um, inhibitory neurons throughout the brain. And I open a three millimeter cranial window over both of these areas um, and eliminate that entire surface. And what you find is that the rate at which uh, animals obtain rewards um, falls off very dramatically when you start uh, illuminating either the motor cortex or the dorsal surface of the cerebellum. Um, and so I, I think that these are good behaviors to study for, for studying these circuits. Um, so in terms of studying the, the, the functional properties uh, of these neurons, you can see that a really important part of this is understanding what cerebellar granule cells do they're sort of the gateway for the portal information to enter the cerebellum. Um, and when I started my postdoc, not very much was known about what these neurons do um, during these types of learned volitional behaviors. So uh, I combined uh, a lot of really nice genetic tools from many labs that allow me to uh, selectively express the green genetically encoded calcium indicator GCAM 6F in cerebellar granule cells. And I have a cranial window that's generally centered on the paraverbal vein that exposes uh, 
the right firmness of a lot of those 6A and 6B and the medial hemispheres of the simplex and cruise one models. And in a typical imaging session, which lasts about 30 minutes and exposes about a 300 micron field of view, um, I generally find around on the order of 100 uh, active granule cells in one of these uh, one of these imaging sessions during this behavior. Um, so I'm going to sort of breeze through these results because they've been out for a while, but basically when we dug into the responses of individual granule cells by aligning their activity to uh, reward delivery um, and averaging across trials on which we either delivered the expected reward shown in blue or withheld it shown in red, what we found is that some cells selectively responded when the reward was delivered, others selectively responded when the reward was withheld, and we found a, another class of neurons that we just call anticipation cells that made up about 10% of uh, the neurons we analyzed, and we call them that because basically what they did is they turned on during the delay period following the forelimb movement, which is this dashed vertical line, but before the animal receives the reward, um, and then they turn off when the animal gets the reward, but if you withhold the reward, they stay on a little, off, a little longer as though the mouse is like uh, holding out for the reward to, to come until at some point he sort of gives up and concludes it's not coming. And we formalized all that more precisely with an analysis of licking that I won't get into today. Um, but we, we wanted to, uh, to do a sort of negative control for our interpretation of these uh, neurons are doing. And so uh, I got rid of the forelimb movement and then just played a tone that predicted a reward um, one second later. Um, and you know, we found neurons that did similar things uh, to what I just described. Um, and then we wanted to challenge these anticipation cells with an unexpected reward. So the idea of an unexpected reward, of course, is that the sensory motor uh, experience is, is pretty similar, right? You're still squirting water in the mouse's face, he whisks, he licks, he drinks, swallows, gets rewarded, all of these things are, are the same, but there's not really any anticipation, right? And, and indeed, what we find is that these neurons stay silent throughout the delivery of an unexpected reward. And the last thing we did was to show um, that these responses mainly uh, emerge and become widespread over the course of, of days of exposure to this task. Um, so, armed with this sort of basic understanding of, of what these granule cells do during uh, the learning of these types of tasks, uh, I wanted to take this back up the circuit and, and try to compare and, and, and understand how uh, information has, has been sort of transformed or, or differs from the representations in uh, neocortical layer 5 cells. And so, I've um, developed some strategies for, for simultaneous uh, recording of these, these ensembles. So, um, using you know, more genetic tools from a lot of labs, I'm able to have uh, expression of DCAM6 um, selectively throughout layer 5 pyramidal neurons of the neocortex along with cerebellar granule cells. And so, you know, here you see the pathways of these neurons and their axon terminals in the pontine of that. Um, and an optical strategy to access both ensembles, uh, to access granule cells using the cranial window that I described before. Um, and for the premotor cortex, I implant a one millimeter uh, microprism that allows me to view layer 5 from the side, and it allows me to access the deeper parts of layer 5 that are known to be enriched for subcortically projected neurons. So, uh, with this strategy, um, you generally get on the order of 80 uh, active neurons of each type in the field of view that we record with, um, with video rays of proton. Um, the behavior that I briefly described before is that uh, Mice have to make a sequence of movements, so they push forward and then I push to the left, and push forward and push to the right. Um, these trials occur in blocks of 40 each, and over the course of the two to three weeks that these experiments happen, the mice roughly double uh, their performance by the metric that I won't describe right now, but you can read about. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was to look at uh, the raw activity of individual premotor layer 5 neurons during this test. So each row here is a single. Uh, premotor layer 5 neurons uh, fluorescent strays, and the thin gray vertical lines are individual boiler movements, and the thick dash line down, sorry, the thick dash line down the middle is the time of the transition from a block of left turn trials to a block of right turn trials. So on top, I've got neurons colored in red that uh, preferentially respond during left turn trials, and on the bottom, in blue, I've got neurons that preferentially respond during right turn trials, and they're mapped out on the surface of this, um, this image over here. And so the neat thing was that uh, we were kind of surprised to see that it was really, it's just as easy to find this, uh, this degree and, 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 and uh, prevalence of, of these types of selective responses in the cerebellar brain cells. So um, 
we dug into the sort of temporal profiles of these, uh, these responses in a little more detail. And basically, what we found is that uh, there are neurons that are essentially encoding the various sort of salient aspects of the task. Right? So here's a layer flag neuron whose activity is centered around turn onset, preferentially on left turn trials, or prefer here's one with preferential response on right turn trials, or similarly, uh, neurons whose activity is centered around the time of reward delivery, uh, again, selectively on left turn trials, or in this case, selectively on right turn trials. And uh, we found that in the granular cell layer, you find very similar sorts of canonical, um, canonical response properties. And when we use linear regression analysis to just sort of quantify the prevalence of these different types of activities, pre and post movement, pre and post reward, preferred left turns, preferred right turns, and so forth, uh, there was really no major difference in the sort of degree and prevalence of selectivity. So when we used a more sort of unbiased uh, just quantification of the overall amount of diversity of neural responses in the layer 5 ensembles and granule cells um, by just performing principal components analysis and concatenating single trial activity across the entire imaging sessions, what we found is that the variance explained as a function of number of principal components included rose at basically the same rate, uh, or perhaps even a bit faster in granule cells than in layer 5 cells, indicating that there's really no difference in the sort of total uh, response diversity in these ensembles. Um, and the last thing we did was to look at sort of the buildup of predictive information about the upcoming turn direction prior to the turn onset itself. Um, and when we, when we looked at that, basically this information builds up at the same rate and the same time in these two ensembles. So these are the sort of gross high-level representational comparison. The two ensembles have really a lot in common. But, but for me, what was kind of, kind of incredible is that even though we only sample around 80 neurons of each type out of, say, 50 million cerebellar granule cells and a large number of premotor layer 5 neurons as well, um, without really any principled way of targeting which neurons that we get to report from, um, other than gross sort of aerial choices, um, is that somehow that sampling is enough to give you a pretty good chance of finding uh, individual layer 5 granule cell pairs that do uh, pretty remarkably similar things. Um, there are some systematic differences. so. For example, uh, when you have these high correlated <coughs> layer 5 granular cell pairs, uh, often their disagreements are due to uh, the granular cell having a calcium transient that's missing from the layer 5 neuron. And by analyzing those sort of excess transients, we show that the granular cells tend to be more reliable responders than the layer 5 neurons. All right, so, so one possibility would be that these cells are actually disynaptically connected, but that's sort of statistically almost impossible, particularly because the granule cell gets only four inputs. There's very little way for that to, to be true. Um, so at the other end, the other extreme you can imagine is that this doesn't depend on cortex cerebellum connectivity at all, and it's purely due to shared input. Um, so to exclude that possibility, we um, used up the last couple millimeters of, of space on the head to bring in um, two bilateral optical fibers and plant them down into the basal ponti nuclei, which we virally transduced with inhibitory oxygens. What we found is that uh, for some of these granule cells with these um, sort of interesting task encoding responses that, that we think may have something to do with cortical activity, um, if the activity is abolished when the pons is inhibited, and uh, similarly, uh, correlations between granule cells and layer 5 cells uh, take a pretty big hit when the pons is inhibited as well. All right, so, so then what is happening? Uh, one thing that we thought might be happening is that maybe there's just really a lot of redundancy in both layer 5 representations and in the granule cells. Um, and then you wouldn't really need to sample very much to find highly correlated pairs. And since this task is completely unnatural and, 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 and learned to know it's unlikely that that's sort of a God-given property of the circuit. So we thought maybe this was telling us something about what happens to the activity of these ensembles over the course of learning <coughs> the task. So we took advantage of the fact that uh, two-photon microscopy lets us um, track a fixed set of neurons, both in the cortex and in the granular cells, over the two to three week period of uh, the acquisition of this task. And what we found is, uh, for these sort of highly correlated layer 5 granular cell pairs that we find late in learning, if you track this specific pair back in time, uh, they're generally doing very different things from one another early in learning. And, and overall, it's pretty hard to find uh, early in learning highly correlated uh, pairs of neurons like this. Um, there's a similar thing going on in the encoding of the task. So when you have a, la a layer 5 cell uh, that responds uh, 
uh, robustly following the execution of the left turn trial but not the right turn trial, and you follow this specific neuron back in time, uh, that selectivity is typically absent. Um, analogously, here's a granule cell that responds uh, tendered around the time of reward, uh, selectively following the right turn trial, and early on, there's basically no task locked activity. Um, and this is generally true, there's very little encoding of the task early on, and, and then the selectivity uh, starts to show up, and it might sound good at the task. Um, and I'll just, I'll just stress that a flat line here does not mean that this granule cell was inactive, um, it just means that its activity was not task locked. And overall, we don't see, you know, the number of active neurons goes up and down, but it does not change systematically over the course of, of, of these learning, uh, learning time scales. So as you might have guessed, if the correlations are going up and more neurons are encoding the task, the dimensionality of these responses is probably dropping. Uh, so when you count up the number of PCs that are required to explain half of the activity, either in the granule cells or in layer 5 neurons, you find that, that they take a pretty, uh, pretty big hit over the course of, of learning. And we showed that these correlations among neurons are rising, uh, basically at the same time that the mouse's behavioral performance is improving over these weeks long time scales. Okay, so now we get to sort of the crux of the issue, which is what's the like, systems level interpretation of these changes in, uh, in, in correlations. So the one that I'm sort of pushing on you, you can probably tell is that there's a big reorganization of the activity and more neurons are being recruited into representing the task and so forth. But when we were shopping these results around, it was pointed out to us that uh, there's another possibility that would kind of sort of trivialize these results. And, and that is, you know, imagine that each neuron is representing a fixed motor quantity. And for argument's sake, I'll just call that muscle. So there's some layer 5 cell that represents a muscle, and the granule cell that represents some different muscle. And early in learning, there's a lot of bad movements, and, and maybe bad movements mean that different muscles are incoherent with respect to each other. And then you know, after the mouse has learned, uh, he's making more good movements, and, and maybe good movements means that different muscles are, are, are more correlated with one another. And therefore, even if these two neurons are not changing what they're representing at all, they sort of spuriously appear more, more correlated, and there's not actually a, a real change in what's happening in, in the circuit. Um, so the prediction of that would be that these correlations depend on movement quality uh, rather than the learning timeline that I've outlined. So how do we test that? Uh, noisy mouse behavior to the rescue. Um, expert mice uh, produce good movements, of course, uh, but they also produce plenty of bad movements, really crummy looking ones like this. Um, and conversely, if you look earlier in learning, uh, it's of course true that in general the performance is worse, but um, sometimes they're still producing nice looking movements, right? So this gives you um, this sort of coveted you know, internal double dissociation, right? Where if I compare these two groups of trials, what I'm doing is holding the learning state constant because these two groups of trials are drawn from the same imaging session, but I'm varying the movement quality between these two groups of trials. Alternatively, if I uh, compare these two groups of trials, what I'm doing is varying the learning state, so late versus mid learning, but I've broken this relationship between learning and movement quality because the late learning trials are crummier than the mid learning trials. All right, so what's the answer? Do these uh, correlations track the quality of the stage one? Um, so for this group of trials, what I do is take the neural activity on all the trials and concatenate it into a large data mix <coughs> and the pairwise correlation coefficient between every pair of granule cells and layer 5 cells. And this is a cumulative distribution uh, shown for each granule cell uh, what's the correlation for its best matched layer 5 neuron. If I compute the same thing for the crummy trials from the same imaging session, there's no difference in correlations. So changing the motor uh, quality within a given imaging session is not enough to change the cortex cerebellum correlations. All right, so what about these good-looking um, movements in the middle of learning? Uh, what you find is that the correlations are substantially weaker than the bad trials at the end of learning. Whereas in the expert trials, the correlations are equally high in good and bad movements, and so the the conclusion here is that these correlations are really rising with the learning state per se, rather than with moment-by-moment -moment variations in uh, movement quality. So the sort of broad summary that we have of what's happening in these, in these ensembles over the course of learning is that early on, you have a sort of relatively more diverse set of uh, neural activity patterns in, in these two areas, um, with relatively uh, less overlap. And over the course of learning, they're converging onto a narrower set of activity patterns that are more similar to one another and encode the task uh, more strongly. 
So to summarize by saying that you know, we have these skilled boiler tasks that, uh, that mice can, can learn in, in weeks and that engage both these circuits. Uh, we've shown that granule cells develop uh, seemingly cognitive or work related signals that are reminiscent of the kind of things people have seen throughout various areas of the neurocortex. And then we went in and shown with simultaneous recordings that uh, neocortical layer cognitive and granule cells uh, actually do converge on sort of shared dynamics over the course of, of learning. Um, and in the future, we're excited to, to try to understand the mechanistic basis of this learning process. Um, you'll notice that I didn't talk about uh, complex bikes at all, but if you're interested, I have a poster uh, doing two photon mesoscope imaging of complex bikes um, during the acquisition of one of these tasks and, and showing how uh, large scale synchronization emerges <coughs> over time. So, with that, I'd just like to thank my advisor, Nishin Lo, uh, Tony Kim, who's an engineer in Mark Schinsky's lab and has been my post collaborator throughout all of this work. Uh, Sir Yige Kuli and Jonathan Cabin, who are theoretical collaborators who did uh, a number of simulations related to cortex cerebellum data that I didn't have time to go into, and a number of other engineers and, uh, and, and, and computational people who helped with various aspects of the test. Thanks.